Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that has no hollow, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink, thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not, through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. I'm... Lindsay. Yeah, I'm Lindsay. <laughs> Actually, I was just thinking about it. Uh, now for this week's merch announcement really quick, and then uh, I will do merch tour. Lindsay, you'll do a little scholarship announcement, and then we are into the show. Sounds good. Uh, going a little more classic this week, a traditional monogram lockup on premium tees and hoodies available in a few colors. Very earthy vibe. I can see our camping and hiking listeners enjoying this one. So you can head to uh, badmagicmerch.com, of course, and check that out. And you can head to dancummins.tv for tour tickets if you want to check out a stand-up show. Going to be in New Orleans and <gasps> Philadelphia the weekend this show comes out. The stand-up theater tour continues. I'm so excited. Going <laughs> to too. my favorite city. <laughs> yes. The, the whole team's coming to New Orleans, actually. Yeah, yeah, Doing a big fun. team retreat in mm. New Orleans. Uh, okay. Just one last reminder, and then we'll put it to bed. But the Cummins Family Scholarship Fund is now open and active. Please sp- uh, find yourself at what <laughs> i can't even speak uh please make your way to learn more dot scholars apply dot org backslash cummins backslash tons of words uh if you and it'll be in the episode description so you don't have to remember it yes and also if you go to badmagicmerch.com there will be a tab at the top that you can click on it'll tell you the step-by-step instructions in case you get into it and you're confused and the link will live there as well mm-hmm. three five thousand dollar scholarships and uh people were asking it's not available in canada this year just because we're just getting our feet wet trying to figure out how this works the conversions and all of that it's oh, a yeah. different system the way that their university system works versus the collegiate system in america yeah. so this year just americans but uh next year we are going to attempt to Open it up to the Canadians. Oh, okay. Anybody else? Just out of curiosity? Uh, one step at a time. One step at a time. One step at a time. Uh, what fan horror do you have for us today? Um, well, True paranormal stories? Well, Daniel, hmm? I have three stories this week. Uh, my first two are like real, like, huh, kind of hmm. like head scratchers, weird. Uh, yeah, we'll leave you feeling, I think, uneasy. And then my third story, we are going to make our way to the domes in Arizona. I don't know. I haven't heard of the domes. Well, you're going to find out about the domes. Find out today. Uh, My first story takes us to Maine, set in a remote farm somewhere near the 100-mile wilderness area of the Appalachian Trail. Or Appalachian. (laughs) Rural isolation adding to the horror for one very unlucky family. And then I'll cover the short story of the Delhi Purple Sapphire, also known as the Cursed Amethyst. <gasps> no! Talking about crystals. Uh, an allegedly haunted object that now resides in the British Museum of Natural History. Are you sure it's not this one? I'm sure. <laughs> not not that big, but I think quite, oh. quite a bit more valuable. Oh. Uh, are you ready to get started? Decent amount of location set up for this first, first story as you settle in. Okay, well, I have some socks and I even have a special blanket this week. So first, my blanket, it's too hard to show uh, like by holding it up, but I would like to thank Phil and Liz in Dallas mm-hmm. for, um, this is from, is it uh, Bucky's? Oh yeah, the, the Bucky's Truck Stops. From Bucky's Truck Stop. Uh, it says, <laughs> Every year they do like limited edition Halloween blankets yeah. and uh, their daughter nabbed this for me. Can't talk right now. Uh, I'm doing spooky stuff. So this is what cute. the like little logo on it looks like. And then also thanks to Christy also in Dallas for my awesome socks this week. Look uh, at that. So nice. Yay. <laughs> uh, today we'll be headed to a place that is one of the mo- most remote areas of the lower 48 states of the U.S., the 100 mile wilderness. The 100-mile wilderness is a massive section of the Appalachian Trail running between Abel Bridge, just south of Baxter State Park, and Monson. It's generally considered the wildest section of the Appalachian Trail and one of the most challenging to navigate and traverse. And that's because throughout most of the Appalachian Trail, there are tons of major road crossings where you can easily access like a a nearby town. Uh, Maine's 100-mile wilderness is, is the biggest exception to that. 
The Appalachian Trail crosses no major roads during this entire 100-mile stretch. So once you enter the wilderness, there are no easy bailout options. The southern 50-ish miles is said to be the most difficult half as the path traverses both the Chairback Mountains and the Whitecap Mountains. One of the only establishments there, besides a smattering of private homes, is Shaw's Hiker Hostel, located at the southern entrance of the wilderness, which offers food drops via a few remote logging roads that crisscross the trail. Overall, the area is remote, pristine, beautiful, and some say maybe a bit haunted. At the very least, there's something haunting about the isolation and the wide open sky. It's a place where the natural landscape feels intensely powerful, sometimes maybe too powerful. You might feel like it could easily overtake you and nobody would be there to notice because it could, and it has. That's exactly what happened to many an unfortunate hiker. In May of 1983, Jesse Albertine Hoover headed out towards Maine, the northeasternmost U.S. state, to hike the Appalachian Trail and the 100-mile wilderness. Jessie was 54, lived in White Settlement, Texas, and sadly, on November 5th, 1982, her husband, Eugene, had been killed when he was hit by a car. And the sudden loss of her husband after 30 years of marriage was unbelievably painful for Jessie. Soon after Eugene's death, she began to talk about hiking the Appalachian Trail all the way from Maine to Georgia. Years before, she had seen an article in the National Geographic uh, magazine about the famous trek, and it had really resonated with her, and so off she went. And then nearly two months after beginning her hike, Sometime in July of 1983, she disappeared. She was reported missing, was never found, despite having made extensive preparations. She had created a detailed itinerary of when she would arrive at major stops along the trail to pick up supplies and wire for money. She even made plans with her doctor to get refills for her epilepsy medication, and suddenly she just didn't show up at the next stop. A multitude of northbound Appalachian Trail hikers were questioned uh, that summer about whether or not they'd seen Jesse. None of them said they had. Park rangers never found a body, clothes, her blue backpack, despite having a large-scale search operation in place for another missing hiker in the same area at the same time. A spokesperson for the rangers later said, We went over the woods with a fine-tooth comb. If she was there, we would have found her. We don't ignore people in the woods. Well, nearly four decades on, no clues have ever turned up. The same thing happened to Geraldine Inchworm Largay, She was 66 when she went missing in the Maine wilderness on July 22nd, 2013. She had been walking all the way from Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, was planning on hiking to Mount uh, Katahdin before she vanished from the trail just north of Rangeley, Maine. She was supposed to meet up with her husband, but never showed. Geraldine was last seen alive on Monday, July 22nd by three young southbound men on Lone Mountain, about three miles south of the Spalding Mountain lean-to. They said she appeared to be fine when they saw her. She texted her husband around the time they saw her and then continued on towards Spalding and completely disappeared. Nobody at Spalding ever saw her arrive. Hundreds of people contributed to a massive search for Geraldine on foot, ATV, horseback, and airplane. Over 100 search and rescue personnel and multiple search dogs did a fine-tooth comb grid search of the Lone Mountain area. Tips also poured in. People speculated that she might have been murdered or that perhaps she had fallen in the river. Some hikers thought that she might have, uh, they might have seen her on the trail but weren't sure. Others said they'd seen some, quote, sketchy men who they thought might have done her harm. Psychics called to report visions of her, including one who insisted that she had broken her ankle and was lost and stranded but alive. And then Geraldine would be found in a very unfortunate way. From what investigators pieced together, she had somehow lived in the woods for over a month making notes about her journey in a black-covered notebook that summer, and she kept writing after she lost her way even as her food supply dwindled along with her hopes of being found. She wrote a final entry that she dated August 18th. When you find my body, please call my husband George and my daughter Carrie. It will be the greatest kindness for them to know that I am dead and where you found me no matter how many years from now. It would be two years before a logging company surveyor stumbled upon her campsite and her remains. She had died of exposure and starvation. Investigators also uncovered messages that she tried to send to her husband, but without cell phone service, were not delivered. In some trouble, Geraldine wrote, got off trail to go to breakfast, now lost. She asked him to call the Appalachian Mountain Club uh, uh, to see if a trail maintainer can help me somewhere north of Woods Road, XO. Lost since yesterday, she texted later. Off trail, three or four miles, call police for what to do, please. How terrifying, how sad, What a lonely, scary way to die, lost in such a remote, isolated area. 
While few people have done more than hike in this remote area of the country, they've actually decided to live year-round out in this remote wilderness. For those who have decided to make their homes there, I wonder who or what else might be hanging around them in the 100-mile wilderness. What spirits of fallen hikers might show up around their incredibly isolated homes in the deep darkness you only find far out in the country, far away from civilization? And if spirits do show up, almost no one is around to help them deal with whatever torment they might bring. Time now for the tale of a haunting in the hills. Like how so many stories of hauntings begin, the following family who found themselves living in the 100-mile wilderness thought it would be a new start. In the early 2000s, documentarians Jerome and Robin thought they were getting a great deal. The two had been looking to move out of New York City for some time with their 10-year-old daughter, Kara. Robin, who was four months pregnant with twins, had wanted to relocate, and the pregnancy added some extra urgency. Instead of waiting for farms in upstate New York or Connecticut and their price range to hopefully go on the market, they expanded their search and eventually heard about the intriguing 100-mile wilderness. To Jerome and Robin, it didn't sound scary to be out in such a remote area. Both had, in the course of their documentary or documentary work, been to numerous far-off places. Robin had worked on a docu-series in the Middle East, camping for days on sandy dunes under the burning heat. Maine sounded pretty easy by comparison. When they discovered a farm for sale for the right price with the right amount of land, they jumped at the chance, packing up the family's things, and they headed north. Immediately, all three were taken with the postcard-like scenery. Their farm was on a long, wooded slope with a house at the top of a hill, the barn below. Robin loved that you could see the animals from the kitchen window, and there was a large workshop that Robin and Jerome could convert to a studio for film editing. The farm was also the perfect place to add to their family, and the couple soon did, welcoming a girl and boy, baby girl Quinn, baby boy Hendrix, twins. Kara doted on her younger siblings, and it seemed like everything was going well. That was until the man appeared. Kara had a habit of sneaking downstairs and eating leftovers once the rest of the family had gone to sleep. She didn't lie to switch on, or she didn't like to switch on any lights when she came downstairs, just in case her parents noticed and might send her back to bed. One night she was on her usual leftover hunt when she heard what sounded like a fork scraping across the counter. In the dim light of the microwave clock, she saw him. A man was sitting at the kitchen counter, calmly eating leftovers and drinking milk from the carton. Stifling a scream, Kara hurried upstairs to her parents' room, woke them, and dragged them downstairs, babbling about a man in the house. But by the time they got downstairs, nobody was there. All the doors were still locked, just as they'd been when her parents, Jerome and Robin, had shut the house down for the evening. Her parents wrote the entire counter off and counter off as Kara having an overactive imagination. Maybe they shouldn't have let her watch whatever she wanted on TV, and then life continued on as normal. For everyone but Kara, at least. She couldn't stop thinking about the man. She started having trouble sleeping. When she did sleep, she often had nightmares. When her parents saw the dark circles under Kara's eyes and the way her gaze skittered over to the corners of the room, they wrote it off as a phase she was going through. But then came the noises, noises heard by more than just Kara. One morning when the family was all downstairs for breakfast, they heard a clunking sound upstairs. Clunk, 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 clunk. One of the uh, Kara cried out that it sounded like footsteps. Jerome raced upstairs, but nobody was there. Weirdly enough, downstairs, the rest of the family couldn't hear any footsteps upstairs now, not even Jerome's. Later, Robin will think that something was trying to separate Jerome for the rest of the, from the rest of the family. Within a few weeks, it started to seem like everything about the house was just wrong. The kitchen and living room always seemed to smell like rotting sewage, a smell that gave Robin and the younger children painful headaches. Bedrooms turned from warm to freezing in a matter of minutes and then to stifling heat a few minutes later. Kara kept insisting that things had been moved around in the kitchen overnight, like napkin holders and mugs. Soon, Jerome and Robin noticed it too, taking care to note exactly where things were when they went to bed at night. Now, Jerome, Robin, and Kara were having trouble sleeping and nightmares. And all of them had the feeling that they were being watched, tinged with an overwhelming sense of dread. And the family began to notice that this feeling was most intense near the barn. Robin became convinced that there was something in there, not the cows or the pigs or the chickens, but something else, something watching, waiting to enter the house. One night, she woke up in the early hours of the morning and noticed weird lights dancing along the curtains. She went to the window, the window she had previously enjoyed looking out of and watching her children play outside or her husband do some work, and she frowned. The barn door was wide open. 
Robin, driven by a feeling of intense curiosity, a need to know, she put on a coat and went outside, wondering if maybe some local teens were playing a prank. If they, in fact, had local teens. The few neighbors they had that she knew of were also farmers, and she had never seen any children around. Still, she went out to the barn and pulled the string to turn on the overhead light. Nothing in the barn had ever struck her as creepy looking before, but now it was eerie to see dozens of pairs of eyes turned to her at the exact same moment. Pigs, cows, chickens. It struck her that the animals had never been so alert before when she came in, not unless something had already been in there, causing a racket. And even then, they were farm animals. Mostly they snorted and rolled around and ate and slept. But every single one of them was staring at her right now, looking as if they were waiting for something about to happen. Robin made a strange decision. She'd stay in the barn until the morning, hoping to catch whoever it was that was playing a prank on her. She settled onto a bench and prepared herself for a long night. As the hours wore on and the old barn began to creak in the wind, Robin thought that maybe she should go inside. But just when she finally resolved that nobody was coming, a storm had picked up outside and heavy rain was falling. Lightning crackled over the mountains, and she chose to wait until the storm passed to then run back into the house. She settled on a milking stool to wait out the storm. The animals were all dozing, the chickens roosting. Crack! A burst of lightning crackled overhead, illuminating the barn, and Robin screamed. Standing in the corner was a man, streaked with dirt, smiling as though he knew her. I will do it, he said, his voice strangely flat. I will. Another flicker of light and the man was gone. Robin bolted for the house, storm be damned. She had to get out of the barn. When she made it inside, she was soaking wet. It was long past time for the family to have gone to bed, but the light was on in the kitchen. Kara was sitting on the kitchen floor in tears. What happened? Robin asked. Did you have a nightmare? I saw him, Kara said through tears. I was reading a book and I looked above my bed at the vent. He was in the ceiling. He was staring at me. Robin woke her husband, and she and Jerome would search the attic that night, trying in vain to find a person. But every time they thought they saw something shifting, it would be nothing more than a pile of boxes. And then, as though things couldn't get worse, multiple things started making themselves known on their property following that terrible night. One day, Jerome raced inside, telling Robin to call for an ambulance. Rambling, he recounted a story about meeting a man near their house on the road who looked like he'd been in a horrific accident. Robin and Jerome ran back down to the road to check on him after placing the call. Robin saw him in the distance, but then staggered. But then he staggered behind a tree, and when they made it to that tree, the man was gone. They embarrassingly called the ambulance off, told whoever answered the phone that the bleeding man had just disappeared. Who was he? Someone real? How could he be? He vanished, like the man from the barn. A ghost then? Adding to their overall confusion, Robin would spot droplets of blood on their kitchen floor that led to the phone, as if the bleeding man had called the ambulance himself. Next to the phone, there was a single bloody handprint. Now Robin wondered... Was the farm some place that hikers on the Appalachian Trail had previously come to get help? Had some of them stayed there as a place of refuge but unable to contact the outside world, perhaps died in their home, and now their ghosts lingered on? After the incident with the man who looked like he'd been in an accident, Robin noticed that Jerome was spending less and less time with the family, and more and more time in the workshop. Some days he left her bed in the middle of the night. When she asked him what he was up to, he just said that he had to finish a big project, and then wouldn't give any more details just walked away when Robin asked questions. Robin had no memory of him taking on such a project. When she pressed the next morning, he still wouldn't give details and he forbade her now from going into the workshop to see what he was working on. He had never done anything like that before in their marriage. For the first time ever, Jerome scared her. If he did anything to her, who would be able to help her? They were so isolated, so alone. The quiet acres of nature around their farm no longer felt peaceful and free. It felt like she was in a prison. After this had been going on for weeks, Robin decided that enough was enough. She had to go see. And she snuck out to the workshop when Jerome had driven into town for some supplies. And what she saw shocked her. His normally neat, organized notes were spread in a jumble across his work table. Instead of being written in his precise handwriting, it seemed like what he had written had been scratched down by an animal. When she lifted some of the papers up, she saw that he'd pressed down with the pen so hard that he'd gouged lines in the wood. On one page, there were no words at all, just a series of drawings of faces. All of them in agony, with their mouths open, their tongues lolling out. One of them was the man she had seen in the barn. Another was the man they'd called the ambulance for. And there was a third, a woman whose face was so emaciated, like she had starved to death. She was reaching a hand out as though to reach right through the page and grab her. What are you doing here? Jerome's voice boomed. Robin spun around. He was standing in the doorway of the workshop. This is my work, he roared. This is mine. I'll do it. I'll do it. 
He charged at it, but Robin slipped by him, now running up the hill to the house. When she got in, she locked the door. She heard him still yelling, I'll do it! I'll do it! Where had she heard that before? She thought about calling the police, but Jerome hadn't hit her or anything. She went to her bedroom and sat down and tried to process everything. What was happening to Jerome? What was happening to all of them? What did she need to do? A few minutes later, Jerome knocked on the door, and his knocks were normal. Honey, he said in a jovial voice, I think you forgot to unlock the door. He seemed like how he used to be. And Robin did let him in. And when she questioned him, he had no memory of going into a rage. When she asked him about the workshop, he said he hadn't been in there in months. Robin told him what he'd been doing and he seemed genuinely shocked. She told him she was so concerned. Maybe it was time to go to the hospital, have them run some tests. But those tests wouldn't account for the men that she and Kara had also seen. Maybe the twins had seen them too. What if those things were showing up around her babies who couldn't tell anyone what they were seeing? She told Jerome that she thought they needed to move now. There was something really wrong with their home. To her surprise, he started shouting at her again, his eyes taking on the same steely dark look they had in the workshop. He shouted, saying she was always attacking him, always criticizing him. That he knew that she was cheating on him too because he'd come into the bedroom and seen her lover standing at the foot of the bed wrapped in bed sheets. And she should shut her mouth before she did something she'd regret. Because I'll do it, he said before stalking off. I'll do it. Robin was in shock. This was not the man she'd married. And she did not have a lover. Who was standing there in the bedroom? Robin was more scared than ever of Jerome now and of her home. Jerome started carrying everything as though it were a weapon at this point, even a pencil. And his hands were sometimes bleeding mysteriously. Also, when she opened her closet or dresser, she found little symbols carved into the wood, the same symbols she had seen in the workshop. It felt like she was living in some version of that old movie, The Shining. Yeah, get the fuck out of there. Would Jerome actually hurt her or the kids? And Jerome wasn't the only one who was changing. Kara was too now. All of a sudden, not long after Jerome's outburst, she didn't want her mom to come into her bedroom. She said she had to clean up something and couldn't leave. Robin gave her some space, and then when she came back to check on her, Robin heard her voice through the door. It was a deep growl, nothing like her normal voice at all. Robin didn't feel like she had anyone to turn to, but she got Jerome anyway, hoping he could at least get Kara to come out of her bedroom, and maybe helping their daughter would snap him out of whatever was happening to him. To her horror, after she told Jerome, he charged angrily upstairs and burst into Kara's room. Kara was laying in a heap on the bed, a layer of something white over her. As she watched, the white began to wriggle and move, and Robin screamed. Her daughter was covered in maggots. Oh. Before Robin could do anything, Jerome launched across the room, picked Kara up by the throat, shouting that <gasps> she had to respect her elders. But rather than look terrified, Kara hung limply like a puppet, her eyes glassy, a creepy smile on her face. Then the smile contorted and her jaw seemed to unhinge like a snake's before she spat in Jerome's face. But she didn't spit saliva, she spat maggots. Then a blast of wind pushed them back out the door, forcing Jerome away from Kara. As Kara stood up, Robin thought she floated a few feet off the ground and then Kara's bedroom door slammed shut and Jerome was on the ground, knocked out cold. A moment later, Robin heard Kara say in a soft voice, please don't hurt them, I'll do anything and all the maggots had vanished. Had she really seen them? Without knowing what else to do, Robin arranged for Kara to stay with her parents for a while now. She thought she'd call a priest or a pastor, someone, but every time she intended to pick up the phone to do that, the dark energy in the house intensified to the point that she was afraid to. It felt like the house was silently telling her that there would be consequences, serious consequences for reaching out. Also, as soon as Kara went away, Robin started losing time, waking up in places she didn't remember. Waking up to the twins screaming in the room due to not being fed or having their diapers changed, things were starting to feel really dangerous. Jerome, in one of his more lucid moments, told her that she'd been speaking in a weird voice, not acting like herself. It was beyond clear that the family needed help. Robin drove into town for groceries, and away from the home she felt like she used to. She used a payphone to call the priest, and after she broke down into sobs, thank God he did agree to visit and try to help. After taking a long walk around the property and looking extremely concerned, he told her what Robin feared. Their house was home to what he believed to be some sort of powerful demonic energy. He did a cleansing, told them to call him again if anything returned, and then seemed eager to leave. Whatever he did, it did help. She and Jerome were more or less themselves again, but a dark energy still lingered, and they felt it starting to build again. They worried that it would only be a matter of time before things were just as bad as before, so they called more people to come to the house, including a medium. The medium told them that there were several spirits in their house. They thought it was their place of refuge. One man, he said, had stumbled onto the farm, delusional from starvation. And then two other people whose spirits now lingered also stumbled over to the farm, starving and dangerously dehydrated. 
and the first man, not in his right mind, decided to put them all out of their misery. He dragged them to the barn, shouting, I'll do it, I'll do it. And then after that, he hanged himself in the <gasps> attic. And when his body was eventually found, it had been decaying, covered in maggots. The medium believed this all happened directly above what was now Kara's bedroom. Finally, the medium believed that the presences of these agonized spirits had led to the presence of other entities, not all of them human, possibly demonic. He wanted them to leave their house, told them that cleansings, even exorcisms, did not always work, and that the spirits on their property were dangerous. And since they didn't have any neighbors close by, who would be able to help them if things took a more tragic turn? That was finally enough for Jerome and Robin. They decided to sell the farm and leave for good. As they drove away, both were convinced they saw a man in Kara's bedroom window watching them drive, and they felt pangs of guilt wondering what would happen to the next family moving in. God, well, don't let anybody move in. I mean, I know they have to sell it and make their money back, but like, mm. that is creepy. Mm -hmm. oh my God, can you imagine seeing Kyler Monroe just covered in a blanket of maggots? Mm -mm. And then having them all like disappear later, but seeing them so distinctly at first, and then like just a bunch of like uh, exorcist type shit happening. It made me feel like nauseous. Blah. Oh, I know, I know. I kept, I was like, oh, too much, too much. I like that women always know. She knew, <laughs> she knew. Robin was like, we got to go. She knew they needed to go long before they went. Mm -hmm. Stupid men. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like um, guys traditionally, I mean, obviously there's exceptions. No, nope, um, no exceptions. Uh, but uh, more stubborn in that way. Well, I mean, I get it. It's like, it's your home. It's a symbol of your hard work and mm -hmm. sacrifice to get to this point, et cetera. But it's like, you know, sometimes you just gotta go. Gotta cut your losses. Yep. Uh, uh, here is a few photos. This first photo is a photo from the trail, like a view from the trail. And My just God, to show it's you. So beautiful. So beautiful. But how many miles around there are of dense, uninhabited wilderness? That would be terrifying to be lost in. Oh, yeah. Because you, I mean, just looking at this one photo. It's so thick. Yeah, so for people listening, there's like a beautiful lake mm -hmm. and it has a couple little like uh, like islands in it, but you yeah. know, it's not that big. Like think of, you know, uh, like a lake in your yeah. neighborhood or town or whatever. Thick and brush and pine forest. Really dense, really thick. Like feel, well, looking I, I, at it from here, yeah. I feel like I would need like a machete to get through there. The, the next photo shows it better because now you're like a, a trail view of like in the wilderness. Oh my goodness. And you can see like, you know, if you got, you know, 50 feet away from the trail, you wouldn't be able to see hikers. You, no. you, you know, you get like a couple hundred yards away, unless they're being noisy, you wouldn't be able to hear hikers. It's just so thick. What would you do in a situation like that? You're hiking that trail. First of all, I wouldn't hike it yeah. alone. And it irritated me at the beginning of the story of those two older I women. Know. A lot of people do hike it alone. By themselves. I know. I'm like, what? Like, and not to be ageist, but like at a certain point in your life, you have to understand that you are less capable of things yeah. than when you were younger. You know that. Yeah. Dan fell out of his truck this morning and spilled out <laughs> onto the driveway. And we were like, oh my God, this is this is our life now. We're old. We're like, we can't live in the winter anymore. We're going to break a hip. It's like, those are realities as you get older, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know. Like in our relationship, if I was like, yeah, I'm 65, I'm going to go hike, the, hike that Appalachian Trail alone, you would be protesting until the cows came home. Yeah. I mean, I mean, what, what, I mean, I don't know the, the topography of like this area, how it would play out exactly, but like in general, in a mountainous area, what I was always told growing up and what I would do if I was lost is ste step one is you, well, you go down. You're trying to always go like down, not up. Okay, that makes sense. And, and you want to go down ideally to like a ravine where ideally you find some sort of running water. That's what I was thinking. Go and, to the water. Yep. And then once you find the water, you keep following the water because odds are like, well, eventually it would lead you to the sea, but it's like, but at least rather than circling around, uh -huh. you just follow running water down, down, down until you hit a road. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, you know, you just like wait at the road and, and hope that somebody finds you along the road. But this is, that, that would be interesting. And, and towns were often built a alongside water. So it's like. But this is so remote and it sounds like there are very few people <sighs> around. This feels like an especially unique situation. Right. And then in this situation, you, know, you, you could follow water and then you could end up at a lake where the water runs in and the, and the lake could not be near a town. And I guess in that situation, you just walk around the perimeter of the lake, which is going to suck. Mm -hmm. You know, all that brush and hope that you're, you're looking for the outlet. You're hoping that there is one for sure, right. which there almost always is. Yeah. And then again, you just keep following it. At le and at least then you have water. Yeah. Well, the problem is if you don't have water purification stuff. Uh, there's no way you're hiking 
in that capacity without purification. Yeah, yeah you got to have no some, way. But some people don't. Some people don't. Pur- and that would suck because then you, yeah, you risk like dysentery and like there's all kinds of bacteria in that water that are going to, it's worse than not even drinking water. No, no, I know that. I just believe that in this situation, when we're yeah. talking about spending months on a trail, yeah, yeah, yeah. you hopefully, you're, that stuff. you're not just showing up like in your Nikes with, uh, you know, <laughs> one, no, true, one true, true, cutie true. and one bottle of uh, totally. Arrowhead in your backpack. Yeah. Um, so a couple more photos. First one of the the, uh, the missing hiker who sadly did not. Uh, oh my god! Uh, be found, Jesse Albertine Hoover. Jesse, you're too fucking old to be out there by yourself. Yeah, I'm sorry. You just are. It's just I don't care how avid of a hiker you are. You have limitations. This is a massive hike. Massive. We had a friend who went out on it. Yeah, and he and he had already done the PCT. Yeah, and he he came off the trail and like. I don't know, six weeks, he was like, nope, not doing it. Uh, another another photo of the other missing hiker whose remains in journal were later found, Geraldine uh, Largay, uh, no, uh, nicknamed Inchworm. And then uh, this last one, just a pic of uh, a remote farm in the wilderness of Maine. And you can see that there's almost no one else around, right? Just that dense forest, perhaps like one more farm in the distance. But this just reminded me of the location of our story, yeah. Where it would add to the terror. It would be so dark at night. Mm-hmm. And and there would just be like, you could scream. Like literally no one could hear your screams. No. If so, and this is like, it sounded like what the payphone detail made me think that not recent enough for cell phones. So set a while back. Right. And that would be especially terrifying because I always think like in the the classic, you know, horror movie trope, somebody cuts your phone line. Right. You are fucked. You're fucked. If somebody cuts your phone line and also were to, uh, you know, uh, somehow disable your vehicle, you know, like take out your battery kind of thing and hide it, you're at their mercy. Like, it's like, it's like Lord of the Flies or some kind of like you versus them now. Mm-mm. And that photo that you showed, I feel like it's a similar aerial of the lake where it's yeah. like, I'm like, oh, I can see the lake. Right. And man, I just like think about being out there lost, hoping like, Oof. right. Cause there's, I think that that's the lake that we were looking at. Uh, just based yeah, on yeah. its shape. Oh yeah, it might be. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, oh my God, the distance from the lake to that farm, yeah. even in this photograph looks so far. So in reality, it's like, oh no, you're just, that's it. You're just screwed. Yeah, yeah. Would you ever want to go and hike like the Appalachian or the PCT or any of those big, you know, trails that take months and months and months? I doubt it. Oh. I mean, I mean, just because it, like you have to commit your whole life to that. I, I just think about like practical stuff like dogs, kids, like all that, like if we didn't have dogs, kids are very set in their adult lives perhaps. But even then it's like, we can't be podcasters. There's so many things you can't do. That's basically like you're retired uh, for, for what we do. <laughs> I would I would love to do it. I would love to. Mm-hmm. But, I but, like, I, but I'm realistic that it's not really probably in the cards for us. But I would do something where it's like you're out for like a month because you don't have to do the entire trail. You can do sections of the trail. Totally, totally. I would do that. Uh, maybe, yeah. Petty and Dee Dee would, they would like to hike. <laughs> maybe a little hikers. I, actually, I don't think you're allowed to have dogs on the trails. Ah, uh, that'd be a bummer, yeah. Yeah, probably not. Uh, you you oh, got any questions? God, or are you that ready was to do, just uh... so scary. Okay, that bloody handprint on the wall yeah. was a detail that really bothered me. Huh, yeah. Because in my mind, she didn't mention anything or the storyteller didn't mention anything about it like disappearing on its own. So I'm imagining that they had to, to wash, wash it, it. So with that thought in mind, I would have called the cops and said, hi, there's a rogue bloody handprint on my wall. I'd like you to come fingerprint it. Mm. That would have at least given you, I feel, some evidence of whether yeah. it was real, uh, uh, human or yeah. paranormal. Yeah. I thought that that was a weird choice. And of course, at the beginning, when you were talking about the guy when- um, The microwave Kara's, light, carrot, yeah. Uh, uh, next, when she oh, sees him. The vent, looking through the vent. Ooh, that was gnarly. And then of course, yeah. I was like, what, uh, what's the the Denver Spider-Man? Oh, yeah. Immediately took me back to the guy mm-hmm. living in the the mm-hmm. attic. Yeah. If you haven't listened to that episode, go find how, it. Just that, yeah, that detail really creeped me out too. Of just seeing a fucking face looking through the ceiling vent, like some eyeballs up there and just- what, What's really upsetting is we have two vents above our bed. Uh-huh. All of a sudden there's an eyeball. Thank like, God we're going to Seattle around. this weekend. Can't Ay-ya! take it. Uh, I have asked Dan to go like um, in our upstairs hallway is the access point to mm-hmm. our- attic and i'm gonna say attic but it's like you couldn't store anything up there it's just the the pitch of the roof and it's just insulation you would have to be the denver spider-man you have to be some little like tight really skinny weirdo who can like just become be comfortable always laying down always lying down and also like (laughs) the access point like in my house growing up we lived in a uh rancher on a basement so you would go down the one hallway that there was and the access point was this long thing and you would 
pull on the string and a set of stairs would come down. Our access point at our house is like <laughs> like a four yeah. by four box yeah. and there's no stairs. But anyways, I've asked Dan to like go up there and check because I am convinced that I hear something up there. <laughs> and, you know, he hasn't checked. So oh, we probably have to have like a house inspection done. <laughs> Pretend like we're selling the house. <laughs> ah, that's all. You, okay, so you uh, you ready to hear about, hear about a cursed gemstone? Uh, these are like take, take you to like crystals. A, this is a double whammy. I'm already <laughs> scared of people in the attic, and now am I going to fear my own crystals? I don't think so. I better not. You've done this to me. A <laughs> little bit of history uh, on this one before we get into well more history, but also paranormal allegations. Amethysts, as you probably know, are often associated with calmness, clarity, and intuition. Generally positive emotions. But there is at least one amethyst out there allegedly known to bring misfortune and death to anyone who owns it. The Delhi Purple Sapphire, also known as the Cursed Amethyst, has potentially caused over a century of tragedy for many of those who have come into contact with it. I don't believe it. And the amethyst was stolen from India during the Indian Rebellion of 1857, a very bloody rebellion against British rule in India that lasted from 1857 to 1859. Many, many people died. Uh, the stolen amethyst is currently housed in the Natural History Museum in London, located in the museum's vault along with other precious stones. The previous owner of the amethyst locked it inside seven separate boxes in a bank safe. All those boxes weren't uh, enough to keep anyone from, or uh, weren't uh, there to keep anyone from stealing the jewel. They were there to keep people around the jewel safe. He gave specific instructions not to remove the stone until 33 years after his death. His note came with a warning. Whoever shall then open it shall first read out this warning and then do as he pleases with the jewel. My advice to him or her is to cast it into the sea. Time now for the tale of the curse of the stolen amethyst. The large gemstone was stolen from the Temple of Indra in Kanpur and transported to England by Colonel W. Ferris. The stone was initially incorrectly identified as a purple sapphire, uh, but it is actually an amethyst, and Ferris may have been the stone's first victim. He lost almost everything he owned and suffered serious health issues soon after transporting it, and then his son, who inherited the stone, suffered the same fate. So his son decided to give the stone to a friend who then soon died a suicide. And this friend actually left the stone for Ferris's son in his will, so this unfortunate son got, got the stone back, uh, came back into his possession, and then he quickly got rid of it. In 1890, Edward Heron Allen found himself the owner of the cursed amethyst. Heron Allen was known as an ambitious man with an insatiable quest for knowledge. He lived from 1861 to 1943, often referred to as a polymath, a person of wide-ranging knowledge or learning, who practiced law, and also, not a common pairing here, palmistry, uh, the reading of palms, right, a form of fortune-telling, also an expert on violins and Persian literature. I love this guy. A <laughs> very eccentric man of wide-ranging interest, to say the least. Is, it, is, is this Kyler Cummins' descendant? <laughs> or ancestor, yeah. Ancestor. Uh, Heron Allen wrote books on violin making, palmistry, translated Persian literature. He also studied small animals and protozoa and had some various fiction, uh, fiction publications. In Sussex, he was known as a historian and an archaeologist. Why not? Heron Allen was also friends with the famous writer Oscar Wilde and his wife Constance, a well-known guy who traveled in some pretty interesting circles. And after taking ownership of this gemstone, Heron Allen soon experienced a series of misfortunes that he never really described in great detail. Whatever they were, they were enough for him to give the stone to different friends, which he said led to a trail of suicides, apparitions, disasters, and failed careers. And he kept having the stone returned to him. One of his friends who returned it was a singer who found shortly after receiving it that her voice was dead and gone. She never sang again. Heron Allen now threw the stone into Regent's Canal, hoping to be rid of it forever, but just three months later, a dredger picked the stone up, and according to the lore, a dealer gave it back to him. Heron Allen now believed the amethyst was terribly cursed, stained with blood and dishonor. He ordered that the stone be locked away in his bank vault inside seven locked boxes. And he left a note instructing the reader of his letter not to unbox the amethyst, as I said, until 33 years after his death. And then he died in 1943. Not heeding her father's instructions, his daughter unlocked the amethyst and donated it to the Natural History Museum in January of 1944. After the donation, uh, and the donation came with her father's letter, warning the reader of the dangers. And it read in full, To whomever shall be the future possessor of this amethyst. These lines are addressed in mourning before he or she shall assume the responsibility of owning it. The stone is terribly cursed and is stained with blood and the dishonor of everyone who has ever owned it. 
It was looted from the treasure of the Temple of the God Indra at Kanpur during the Indian Mutiny in 1855 and brought to this country by Colonel W. Ferris of the Bengal Cavalry. From the day he possessed it, he was unfortunate and lost both health and his money. His son, who had it after his death, suffered the most persistent ill fortune till I accepted the stone from him in 1890. He had given it once to a friend, but the friend shortly afterwards committed suicide and left it back to him by will. From the moment I had it, misfortunes attacked me until I had it bound round with a double-headed snake that had been a finger ring of Hayden the Astrologer, looped up with zodiacal, it's kind of a made-up word, zodiacal plaques and neutralized between Hayden's magic tau and two amethyst scarabeid of Queen Hatasu's period brought from Thebes. It remained thus quietly until 1902, though not only I but my wife, Professor Ross, W.H. Ryder, and Mrs. Haddon frequently saw in my library a Hindu yoga who haunted the stone, trying to get it back. He would be seen sitting on his heels in a corner of the room, digging on the floor with his hands as if searching for it. In 1902, under protest, I gave it to a friend who was thereupon overwhelmed with every possible disaster. On my return from Egypt in 1903, I found she had returned it to me, and after another great misfortune had fallen on me, I threw it into the Regent's Canal. Three months afterwards, it was brought back to me by a Wardour Street, uh, Wardour Street dealer who had brought it if for, as if from a dredger. Then I gave it to a friend who was a singer at her earnest wish. The next time she tried to sing, her voice was dead, and she has never sung since. I feel that it, ex that it is exerting a baleful... Sorry, so many random words. A baleful influence over my newborn daughter, so I am now packing it in seven boxes and depositing it at my banker's with directions that it not to see that it is not to see the light again until I have been dead 33 years. Whoever shall open it shall first read this warning, then do so as he pleases with the jewel. My advice to him or her is to cast it into the sea. I am forbidden by the Rosicrucian oath to do this or would have done it long ago. Signed, Edward Heron Allen, October 1904. Well, the Natural Mu History Museum put the cursed amethyst on display in 2007, and according, according to curator Richard Sabin, when they were transporting the stone from a symposium of the Heron Allen Society, we drove to the most amazing storm we'd ever witnessed. Lightning was flashing on both sides of the car, and my wife was shouting at me, throw the damn jewel away, you shouldn't have brought it. Savin said that any time he's attempted to attend another meeting of the Heron Allen Society, he has suddenly become terribly sick. The origins of the cursed amethyst remain a mystery. There is no known information about the stone before it was stolen, and little information to be found about it since it was stolen besides Heron Allen's letter. Oh, that's it? Yep, that's it. Oh, it was like a little baby story. Little baby story. Little baby. I wonder why 33 years. That's a very specific number. I mean, it's it's a number that comes up. I mean, I, I will say in conspiracy circles a lot. Thirty three. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's like, six. Uh, uh, I can't remember all the numerology, but it is one of these numbers that has been labeled as evil. It shows up in like um, Freemason rituals, Ew. like the thirty third rite. I think it's called. I'm just kind of pulling this out of my ass right now. But I but I know that like outside of like six six six, I would say that the next big like feared number for people who are scared of that number is thirty three. Do you know the most powerful number in the zodiac? Or I mean, numerology? I don't. Seven? One. one. A one. One. You know who's got a lot of ones? Yeah, you do. This 11, girl. 11. Mm -hmm. I have a very powerful birthday. <laughs> yeah. My numerology is fascinating, actually. Hmm. Yeah, I've, I've never uh, looked much <gasps> into numerology. Can I do your numerology chart? Yeah, sure. Oh my God, it'd be so fun. <laughs> Emily just met with a new um, energy healer medium. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Um, it, it It is interesting to think about that it doesn't sound like anybody did anything to try and cleanse the stone. So like traditionally speaking, yeah. when we're talking about crystals, we bask them in the moonlight and a bowl of water to clear their energy. Like there's different hmm. practices, whether you, Rituals. whether you believe in it or not. Totally. It's like you would think yeah. that people would have, and perhaps they did, and it's just not documented. But, right, right. Um, I learned a new word, a polymath. Yeah, and I you're like, a polymath. Uh, yeah, wide okay. wide range of interests. Mm -hmm, yeah, I was like, oh, you're talking about yourself many many <laughs> moons ago. Uh, and okay, so is this is the amethyst on display now still? Uh, I couldn't figure out if it's on, currently on display. From what from everything I read, it seems that it still is in the possession of the Natural History Museum. Mm -hmm, it's a cool museum. Mm -hmm, but they, I, know, I know that they rotate. That they have so yeah. much stuff, uh, way more than they could ever display at one time. Mm -hmm. And they rotate things around. 
I also did not like the idea of casting it into the sea. Yeah. I'm like, well, someone's going to find it again. That doesn't feel safe. Got to take a boat way out there and throw it way out in the deep water. No, I just think that like, I don't know. And now Smash I, it with a hammer. Well, that's what I was thinking. Like break it to yeah. break up the energy mm-hmm. that it possesses, that it holds on to. And also seven locked boxes. I was like, okay, seven. I know another another uh, number that shows up in like a occult numerology and stuff I know. Yeah. I liked that story. It was fun. Yeah, a little different. Yeah, photos. Yeah, I do. I have a photo. This first one is the allegedly cursed Delhi purple sapphire. Did you wear that purple shirt in honor of the purple sapphire? <laughs> I, I did not. The coincidence. Or maybe the, maybe the stone was talking to me. Oh my. It is a faceted oval amethyst measuring 3.5 by 2.5 centimeters. So not what? terribly big. No. Uh, smaller than this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then that's it. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh. I have one more. I have one more. Uh, Edward Heron Allen. Just a, a picture of the guy who wrote oh, the letter. Oh, hello, handsome. <laughs> He's a good looking guy. Yeah, yeah, and actually when he was, there's pictures of him when he was younger and yeah, very handsome guy. He really kept his hair. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. Actually, you guys have very similar hairlines and I would like you to grow it out. Uh-huh, and then the kind of pompadour over like that. Quaff. Quaff it over. You'd have a nice little quaff. Mm, maybe if I start dressing like that too with bow ties <gasps> and sports coats. Oh my God. Coats. Our kids would be like, what's happening? Who is this? Who well, maybe, are you? Maybe I'm Actually, older. Kyler might think it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, totally. God, he was so funny last night. <laughs> he was cracking us up. Um, and that's uh, yeah, that's, that's all I got. Eddie but that's all, folks. <laughs> um, okay, those were fun. I really liked your stories. Well, thank you. Yes. I'm looking forward to your stories now. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> I love that purple shirt. Oh, uh, thanks. You look extra handsome today. That's nice. Yeah, switch, yeah. switching it up a little bit. Yep. We, I don't know if this happens in other people's relationships where I will like pick something out for Dan as like a gift or we'll be shopping together, which is very rare because I do not yeah. like to shop with anyone other than myself. And uh, we'll pick something out and he's like, try it. He's like, yeah, this is cool. That has lived in your closet know, with for... the tags on for well over a year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You bought it in Atlanta, St. Patrick's Day last year. So almost exactly a year. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, why do you do that? It's like, uh, do you, I don't know if this happens to other people. Like you, you buy a gift for your significant yeah. other and I'm like very amenable. I'm like, yeah, if you don't like it, take it back. I don't care. This guy won't take it back. <laughs> yeah, but I finally broke it out. Yeah, but I like it. It's cool. Mm-hmm. Cool guy. Cool guy. All right, cool guy. What color Layla do you have this week? Blue. Really oh. switching things up. Wow, you are making me like, whoa, who are you? Mm-hmm. You question reality. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, since we're talking about things of... Like, do you believe in this? Do you believe in that? Do you believe in ghosts? Do you believe in guardian angels? Oh, uh, I don't know. I, 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 I'm I, way more apt to believe in ghosts than guardian angels. How terrible. I, mean, I do believe in ghosts. I, I'm, I'm on the fence about guardian angels. Don't you think they're of the same ilk? They could be. Here's my thing with guardian angels. Okay. It's, uh, I, I just know that so many bad things happen to so many people mm-hmm. that the, the, that means, like for me, the concept of them feels unfair. Oh. Where, where it's like, why do some people get protected while others just like suffer brutally? Well, that's like, why do some people get cancer and some people suffer brutally with cancer? Right, right. It doesn't mean that they don't exist. Mm-hmm. It, it just it just bums me out that there's like, if they do exist, that the protection isn't spread around a little bit more. But then wouldn't you want to apply that to the hauntings? Like, why aren't the hauntings spread around more? Like, why do some people, mm, why true. are some people haunted and some people not? Yeah, that's true. Okay, fair. Yeah, okay. good good point. My my take on guardian angels is I don't know if they're like, you know, these little like white creatures with like a glowing halo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I think of is, you know, we've had a lot of loss in my family. And so I do sometimes feel like my family with me in certain things or uh-huh. uh, like a very distinct, like a smell will come over me or a deja vu moment yeah. that no one else could know except for like me and this other family member. And th- when that happens, I think like, oh, Okay, you're here. And then it passes. Mm-hmm. It's fleeting. So that's what it means to me. I don't think yeah. that they're actually there. I don't think that they're necessarily protecting me. Maybe they're guiding me like my spirit guides, but okay. okay. Yeah. Interesting take. All right. Well, let, uh, uh, let's find out what's going on with Alestra. Alestra. Cool. Fucking cool name. And this is also a great opening. Good day, Madam and Monsieur P- Spoop. Isn't <laughs> nice. that great? Uh-huh. Uh, this event that I'm writing you about is only one of many out of what? Sorry. I, uh, I wasn't even going to say anything, but, okay. uh, but Alestra, I think Alestra is also the name. There was this a thing that they would put in these, um, low calorie chips. <laughs> yes, it is. It is the same thing. This right? is spelled differently. This spelled is different, but a pronounced, Lestra. But, but that, o- was, that was, that was, Oh, Lestra. This is a Lestra. Right. And Olestra. With so an a. 
So I know very cool name, but all, but sadly my association with a word that sounds is almost is like diarrhea. They would like yeah, dude, like wow. I'm, I'm sure that Alessia oh, is yeah. aware. Wow, potato chips would have that stuff in them. That's right. And it, and it was not. It wasn't diarrhea. It was <laughs> almost worse. Anal leakage. That's right. That's right. That was a side effect. Like you eat too many of those chips, you're not going to go poop your brains out, but your butthole is going to leak. <laughs> You know how I learned that? Like a, like a drippy faucet. This is a, a very terrible... I'll start the story over because this is a weird <laughs> uh, sidebar. But you know how I learned that? The, uh, the movie The Sweetest Thing. Did you ever uh, see that movie mm. with Cameron Diaz and uh, Christina Applegate? Did, some, did one of them eat too many of those chips? They're like on a road trip. There's like... I can't remember the exact yeah. scene, but they're like on a road trip or something. And they're like eating the chips. And somebody's like, you know, those cause anal leakage, right? <laughs> and I was like, what? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So, sorry. Sorry about that. That's okay. That's I, I, I was... knew something was happening over yeah. there. I just wanted to get it out. <laughs> okay. Good day, Madame and Monsieur Spoop. This event I'm writing you about is only one of many of the out-of-normal experiences I have encountered. I've encountered everything from haunted houses, shadow figures, folklore, creature run-ins, and so on. This specific story occurred a few months ago now, and it is still just as fresh in my mind and just as goosebump-inducing. Let me set the scene. Me and my partner live in Colorado Springs, where the entire city is nestled up to the Rockies. We live out towards the plains of the city and not up in the mountains, which means there's a lot of open fields for us to let our hunting dogs, who don't actually hunt, uh -huh. sniff to their heart's content. I know saying open fields immediately creates a uh-oh effect, but I promise you my story only partially has to do with the fields. We live in a large neighborhood with a metric fuck ton of houses, but in between sets of houses are where these fields reside. There are sidewalks, gravel trails all over, and playgrounds scattered throughout, which makes it feel homey and nice to take the dogs on sniffaris. Like mm -hmm. a safari, but for a dog, just to sniff. That's adorable. Uh-huh. In addition to just letting the dogs do their own thing, we also use these trails to walk them and do this fun thing called bike juring, where they have special harnesses and our dogs pull our mountain bikes so that they can get work while we get some adrenaline and speed. Now that you know a little background and can better picture the area, let's get to the story. As an early riser, I like to take advantage of the lack of people on those trails. I usually wake up at 5 a.m. and get to work by 6, so if I want to do any activity before work, I wake up at 4. Per my schedule, I did wake up at 4 a.m. to take one of the dogs to bike jour as it would get her tired before I brought her to work with me for the day. I had gotten my mountain bike prepared the night before, complete with a headlamp I had rigged to be my bike's own headlight. I got Aylin all ready to go with her teal bike shoring harness, her bright pink glow collar, and her leash. By the time we were ready to go, it was already 4.15, and we would only have 30 or so minutes to finish our route and get back home so I could still get to work by 6. We ended up on a route that took me out just to the sidewalks around the houses and fields as they were completely lit by street lamps, which made my visibility even better. It was still pitch black out, but I could see enough to know where I was going. Plus, I know my area of the neighborhood like the back of my hand. Again, we are on a sidewalk where I can see all the street lamps as I go. And this is an important thing to note. So we're cruising along. Aylin was pulling super hard that day as we reached the point where we needed to turn around for time's sake. This out and back route is a total of 3.5 miles from my front door. I distinctly remember that on my way back to my turnaround point, I looked into one of the pitch black fields and kind of chuckled, remembering a previous scared to death episode y'all did about folklore. The hair on my neck stood up a bit, but I'd done that to myself, thinking of your episode while staring into the void that was the field. Once I turned around and we got going back fast to our house, we're passing all of the same points we had just seen, just as we should have. As I passed that same field, I couldn't help but think of this certain mimicking, copying folklore creature from an episode y'all did, of whom I still refuse to say the name. I truly have no explanation as to why it popped in my head. The whole ride, I was thinking about my meetings at work that day, if Aylin's harness was seated well, and the list of things I had to do once I returned from my ride. As I was zoning in on the field, everything got super quiet, which is never a good sign. It also mm. got darker and heavier. Oh. A bell oh. that sounded like someone is on a bike behind me, wanting me to get my attention, to get me to turn around. I turn around to look so I can move out of their way, 
but I'm greeted by the utter void of black. The street lights that I had just passed are now giving off no light. I couldn't see any houses and there was no one behind me. I screamed, fuck, and then yelled, Aelin, go, 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 because I know better than to sit in a situation with bad energy like that. Aelin started pulling as fast as she could, sensing the urgency in my voice and her being creeped out herself. I started pedaling as fast as I could, and of course, it was all uphill back to my house. Tears streaming down my face, the hair on my neck kept standing up even more than more intensely, and I kept screaming, Aelin, go, baby girl, go, we gotta go. And as I got closer to the house, we were both totally spent but I didn't want to be followed or have anything follow me into my house. So I actually started chanting parts of the opening scared to death prayer. Mm -hmm. I said it about 10 times. This house you may not enter. These lives you may not steal. You are not welcome here. Once I got close to the door, I said it one final time, sternly. And once inside, we plopped down on the floor, both panting. I quickly said, an Our Father and some Hail Marys, and then I ran upstairs to my partner who was sleeping and began crying because what the actual fuck had just happened? happened. Once I'd gotten to work, I must have looked like hell because my cubicle mate said, hey, you okay? And when I told him the whole story, he told me a bit from his Native American heritage and a recent powwow he'd gone to. He told me that bells are used at powwows and during many holy ceremonies, even in Christianity and other religions, because it breaks up energy. Native Americans specifically say it breaks up the negative energy they may be manifesting. He said to me, what if your spirit guardian simply rang a bell as a warning that you needed to hurry out of there? It might not have been immediate danger, but a life choice that needs making or a butterfly effect moment. That blew my mind. It did make me feel better. But why did my neck hair stand up that morning? Why did that creature's name suddenly pop in my mind during my ride when I wasn't even thinking of it? Why could I not see a single thing behind me, even though I had just passed under all those streetlights? Was I saved by a guardian angel? Do I still have a choice that I haven't made yet? Even after retelling this story months later, I truly don't think I'll be going on a bike or run anytime soon. Alestra. Thanks, Lestra. Uh, I will say, uh, that really got me that bell noise. Yes, good job, Logan. <laughs> yeah, it really made me jump. I'm, li I'm literally crying out here. That was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I texted him this morning. I like suddenly thought of it. I was like, ooh, ooh, ooh. No, that was good. That was good. And just so like um, people listening know, the the sound effects like the sound beds that you hear like the scoring that you're listening to when the episode comes out yeah uh that's done after the show mm -hmm. you know just to like set it appropriately to like how we kind of tell the stories well and, like our voices fluctuate so mm -hmm. we never want the music to be overpowering yeah so that was the the rare example i was just so unexpected of a noise added in real time it was fun it's like <laughs> yeah, if you job. listen to the secret suck it's like a button that you use yeah 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 super fun um but anyways, so Skinwalker is what she was thinking of. Maybe I think that was a, I think that was the creature, the mimicking, the mimicking, is, and just the creature out in the woods. Mm -hmm. If I'm remembering correctly, like I'm pretty sure that Skinwalker lore is a uh, there. You know, a lot of reports that they'll they'll mimic your voice and stuff. What if you were like out on a morning walk with our dogs, or or mimic other sounds? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, of course. Um, what if you were out on a morning walk with our dogs, and like you were just walking down the street, and then you turn to look behind you, and all the streetlights are out, and all the houses are missing. <laughs> I mean, I that, it's like it's just all of yeah, a sudden black void. Anything behind, I know that is that's I've never heard uh, of a detail like that before. No, but I, I loved. I've also yeah. learned something new about like a bell breaking up energy, and that makes a lot of sense to me because you can do a healing sound bath. Huh. And those are oh they're yeah, so cool. It's a mm -hmm. meditative experience, mm -hmm. and now it all makes sense it to me. I'm like, oh, yeah. you're breaking up energy mm -hmm. like that. Oh, I get it now. Who knew? Who knew that a bicycle bell could be so uh, important? <laughs> Yeah. And so scary at the right time. I know. <laughs> ring, ring. I can't wait to watch the footage of that. Because like, oh. <laughs> I, I like have it written here and I was like, okay, Lindsay, slow down a second. No, that was good pacing. That was good. That was great pacing. Okay, great, great, great. Yeah. All right. Well done. <sighs> that was really fun. All right. <laughs> well, building the creeps, we're now going to move into another strange, another head scratcher. Okay. I like, okay. I'm loving this idea of like, I don't know. What was that? Paranormal, not paranormal, just mm -hmm. creepy, odd coincidence. Uh, do you think your dreams mean more than what they come at at face value? Like, do you believe in interpreting dreams? Uh, I mean, I, again, it's like one of those things like I'm open to it. I, I, I'm not necessarily, I guess I'm on the fence. I mean, they have those, what do they call? Oh my gosh. I just talked about it not too long ago. Uh, Pre-cognitive, I, I, like uh, dreams. I think it's, you know, when like when you're seeing something like basically this happening in the future in your dream. Uh huh. I think that's called precognition. Precognitive dreams. Um, 
I mean, maybe, yes, I'm open to be like, if I'm going to be open to ghosts, it's like, I can be open to this. But You're I'm, not a big dreamer though, in general, huh? No. Yeah. But I mean, I've always thought of dreams of being probably more like psych psychology or psychological in nature, where it's things, symbolism kind of like from your life, possibly. That like something buried in your sun subconscious? Uh-huh. That's kind of like coming to the surface or, I mean, there's a lot of different inter interpretations of what dreams are, or it's just like you're, um. Tru truly meaningless like your mm -hmm. your body just kind of like discharging all these kind of images mm -hmm. and stuff i can't remember how to explain it but i remember reading this a long time ago and be like oh that's interesting it's like um just kind of like purging these random things out of your brain or something i don't know like a, like a system reboot <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah 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 like a hard reset that's interesting i and i've talked about it before i there's one dream i've been having my whole life mm. and that seems odd to me and it's like an, yeah, uh, is. an elephant stampeding through my house and destroying everything and so it's like weird yeah it's uber specific that is sometimes i'm riding the elephant sometimes the elephant smashes me like it's a weird thing uh -huh. and then right before we met i was yeah. having a lot of dreams about turtles and huh. i can't can't remember exactly now. I should have looked it up. Uh, the, the what the symbolism of a turtle is, but it yeah. was so much so that my girlfriend Robin like gave me a necklace with a turtle on it, and then I met you soon after, and she was like, "See, it was all there in your dream." She believes dreams to be premonition in nature. Oh, okay. Okay. So this story, all based on a dream. It, this is very strange to me. I've really. It's just I'm like, how is that possible? Okay. okay. I, I, I just as you start, just for my own brain, I want to see precognition, or it's going to bug me during your story, if that is actually what I think it meant, or if I just completely just made that up. I want to know. You guys can email me. Foreknowledge of an event. Yep. What Espe is it? A, a foreknowledge of an event, especially of a paranormal kind. Foreknowledge, like meaning like before. Uh, foreknowledge is awareness of something before it happens or exists. So it is okay, like F O R E. Yeah, F O R E, okay, foreknowledge. foreknowledge. I've never heard that word. So, so, it, so it is what I thought. It is okay. that thing of like you are seeing something from the future. This is like so um, exemplary of our relationship. We'll be talking about something, and the moment I say something, you're like, "Hold on, I have to." Like, can't <laughs> let it go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't or go or with it. it'll just distract me. Yep, we can't have a conversation about anything else till you find out the facts. <laughs> do you feel ready to go? I, I'm good. Do you, yeah. do you think Layla wants to be a part of the story? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just we just threw her down. <laughs> just discarded her. Hello, my favorite creeps. I just started listening to the story. I'm sorry. I just listened to the story about the Howling Village and Howling oh, yeah. Tunnel mm -hmm. from today's episode. So we know when this was. Yeah. And the discussion about tunnels being just dang creepy. I have a creepy tunnel story myself. It isn't overly paranormal as far as I know, but it definitely is a head scratcher and weird. It took place in the early 1990s in the city and surrounding area of Rochester, New York. I was 20-something, starting a computer career at a large corporation on the other side of town from my home. Working the swing shift, I had to drive an hour plus each way, the main surface street through the city. Of course, at the end of my shift, it was a late night commute, and I often got home in the wee hours of the morning. I started having a reoccurring nightmare around that time where I was standing in a subterranean man-made room looking at two large openings into dark passages. I had to choose which passage I was going to go down, and the choice was made by looking at the opening. Then I would be swept down into the passage. One passage was a short way to the surface. The other went under the city for a very long time through the domain of some unknown nasty creature I never remembered after awakening. The problem was that I never knew which passage went where when I was presented with the choice, and too often I chose the longer passage and had to avoid detection by the monster. For some reason, I was convinced that this place was entirely real. I don't know why. It just felt so incredibly real. I started to research tunnels in the area, but came up blank. My late commute felt very creepy and surreal those days, and not just because I was a young woman driving through an industrial area alone at night. I was convinced that I crossed over top this tunnel along my route. I worked that job for a few years, moved to a different section of town where the commute route was drastically different, and then eventually resigned from that job for a better paid IT job. The nightmares ceased after I moved and my commute changed. I suppose there could be other reasons for it, uh, for no more nightmares. However, fast forward about 15 years, and having moved several states away, I was looking at a website that detailed urban exploration sites around Rochester, New York, because exploring abandoned places was something that piqued my interest. 
They had an article about a very elaborate drainage tunnel system that was put in just before I started working at that company, not too far away from it, and also along the street that I took to get to work. The tunnels were quietly put in without any news stories about them, and apparently they were then, for some reason, completely abandoned. No explanation. Imagine the jolt I felt as I scrolled through the photos in the article and recognized some of those tunnels from my nightmares. Weird. D. Yikes. Isn't that bizarro? Mm Mm-hmm. Like, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. Like, okay, initially when I read this, I was like, okay, I see what's going on. In your life, you have, like, some difficult decision you have to make. You know, so the two tunnels, you might go this way, you might go that way. It's weighing on your subconscious, just like we were talking about. Yeah, yeah. But that detail at the end, about the, how they looked exactly how she had envisioned them? Yes, and that she never knew these tunnels existed. Right, right. So she hadn't seen these tunnels, and then when shown pictures or whatever, these tunnels, it's like to be like, oh my God, that's exactly what is from my dream. And furthermore, the tunnels were put in without a big hubbub. Right. No right. one really talked about it. So it's and, not like she would have seen them and just forgot. It's not like she would have like casually come across. Right. And then they were abandoned. So whatever purpose they were for, yeah. then they were like, ah, just kidding. Right. So she de- she definitely wouldn't have been in them, mm-hmm. and she definitely wouldn't have seen a photo of them. Uh-uh. And there were drainage tunnels. So it's like, it's uh, that's like, that is subterranean. That's like very specific. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, um, I, hmm. Yeah. I, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of like what those kind of tunnels would look like if you could mistake them for other tunnels or if there really were certain like little defining characteristics, which it sounds like there were. Yeah. Where she's like, this isn't just like, oh, it doesn't look kind of like my tunnel. It's like, nope, I know. I know. That's the tunnel. Right. That's right. That's the tunnel I've been seeing in my dream. I don't know. It's just bizarre. That. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I, I think there's examples of people. Um, I mean, I don't know how you explain this way either. Of like seeing uh, a person in their dream, and then later they meet that person. Mm-hmm. You know, like and the person looks exactly like the person they've been dreaming about. That is, I mean, that is what those pre-cognitive dreams are supposed to be. And I don't know how you explain those other than paranormal. Right, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what they what you're supposed to do with that information. Like when you get the dream. I don't know. I mean, in my mind, why are you getting the dream? Yeah, in my mind, it's like, okay, well, maybe this person has some psychic abilities or is more in touch with the other side, but isn't really aware of it or doesn't yeah. want to feed into it. So these these sort of things happen as like a a way of showing you, like, see, you do, and then you can either give into it and explore it further, or just yeah. write it off as like, well, that was weird, and then oh, move on with your life. Like a little like testing, just showing you, like, hey, it's real, just like a little like a little validation. Yeah. Because I was thinking, other than that, I like that. Because other than that, I'm like, well, I, it would drive me crazy wondering, like, well, what am I supposed to do with those tunnels? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like if those are the tunnels I was shown, am I supposed to get down in there and explore them? Is there a body down there that I'm supposed to help somebody? Ooh, I don't find know. Somebody's remains. Teresita you know? Bassa. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. What do I like to call her? Bossa Nova? No, you nailed it. Yeah. That, <laughs> this yeah. time I got it. Yeah. Sometimes I call her something else. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, it, it is really like, um, it is interesting to think mm-hmm. about. Like, what, what does it all mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? <laughs> okay. I have one more for you. I like these little ones. Yeah. They're fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You don't have to, in a way, you don't have to be as invested. You don't have to pay as close attention to, because it's very quick, right? The details yeah, come yeah. and go really quickly. Um, okay. So to Arizona, to the domes, which- Oh yeah. That's what you mentioned earlier. And I've never heard of the domes. Me either. And Unless they're talking about biodomes, like these, these like, um, uh, do they have biodomes in Arizona? Like those things where it's like, it's like the whole Polly Shore movie, but it's a real thing that they were doing for a while. Like Terra domes, maybe they were called, but it would be to, to basically test if you could live on the moon or on Mars, they would make these completely sealed in domes out in the desert. Mm-hmm. And have people live in them for a while, but see if they could figure out how to like get their plants to keep growing, like basically like have little fish ponds they, and, and self-sustain. I don't think so. They allude to what they were told the domes were used for. It could have been in conjunction with that. We'll find mm, out. Okay. But I just, I'm like, this this story, the, the final detail, I was like, you get the fuck out of there. You okay, go, okay. you go, 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 go. Hello, king and queen of everything spooky and the Mm -hmm. scared to death crew. Listening to your podcast brings my wife and I a lot of joy as well as scaring the shit out of us. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, I want to tell you this one thing. Okay. Somebody wrote me an email and um, they have since lost their sight, but they, Uh. so this like 
gimmick, this game that they play with their dad is imagining the things that we say um, about our bodies, like very real. So like, oh, my legs are killing me. And then like actually picturing your legs. like Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like detaching and then beating you to death or something. So literally like scaring the shit out of someone, like your poop coming out and just being so scary. Like <laughs> now I can, she was like, good luck getting this out of your head ever again. I'm like, oh God, this is terrible. Wait a minute, scaring the shit. I don't think that would mean your poop was scary. That would just mean you scare someone until their poop literally comes out. It could be that too. I, I think we need a different phrasing for like, like, like that shit terrified that shit scared me. me. That's terrifying shit. That would maybe <laughs> that, be the, that's some scary ass shit. That's some scary ass shit. Exactly. <laughs> but like, oh man, my eyes yeah. are my eyes are bleeding. They're so tired. Well, then you uh, like think about it. It's so funny. Is that a phrase? <laughs> my eyes are bleeding. They're so tired. Yeah, I feel like my eyes are bleeding. You've never said that. I've never heard that. <laughs> oh my god, you need to get out from under whatever rock you're. Logan, in. have you ever heard somebody say like, "I'm so tired, my eyes are bleeding"? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, Lindsay. I've never heard that. <laughs> I think you. I think that's only you. you know, oh. <laughs> that's a great because that's that's creepy. It's like, I feel like oh, I'm so eyes. tired, my eyes are bleeding. I, I'd be like, what? what? You're just, like, you're, that's like a horror movie. Well, maybe. <laughs> oh no. I love that. Okay, bloody eyes. <laughs> God, oh man, I'm exhausted. Feels like my eyes are just falling out of my head and like laying in a mangled <laughs> heap on my cheek. That's not what I said. <laughs> I also say things like my teeth are wearing sweaters. That is, a, that's a thing. That's a thing. Oh, I didn't know that teeth was a thing. Teeth sweaters is a thing. Is uh -huh. that when you don't brush your teeth? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. I like to call it also like molar moss. Ooh, molar I, moss. Yeah, that's I like to good. call it uh, tooth turf. Tooth, tooth turf. turf. Yeah. Ah, all right. Back in. Okay. Okay. So back to scaring the shit out of us. Mm -hmm. My wife and I love exploring abandoned places or places that are assumed to be haunted. One of these particular places we explored is called the domes. Anyone who lives in Arizona knows exactly what they are. The buildings were going to be used to develop computers back in the 80s, but then the plans fell through. They have since been abandoned and have become a hangout spot for high schoolers and such. Huh. However, that's not the only thing they've been used for. They were also used for satanic rituals and sacrifices. It has been documented that hundreds of chickens, cut up goats, and possibly human sacrifices have taken place there. Words can't even describe how evil this place feels. Mm. I have visited, I had visited this place a few times back in high school and hadn't had anything too crazy happen, but the night my wife and I went tops them all. It's worth noting that there is barbed wire fencing around this place because it is private property. In high school, I did trespass, but now that I'm a grown up with a state job and whatnot, my wife and I were not going to go past the fence on this trip as I didn't want to lose my job if I got caught. Mm -hmm. My wife and I decided to go to the domes at roughly 1 a.m. We arrived at our destination and parked on the other side of the road. My wife is very in tune with the supernatural and was feeling everything out as we sat in the car. Once we determined all was safe, we got out of the car and walked to the fence line. We walked maybe 10 feet before we heard what sounded like three little girls laughing. These didn't mm. sound like the laughs of other humans. Rather, they sounded disembodied with each voice having layers or something to it. When I had investigated haunted houses in the past, if I'd hear or see something spooky, I'd go towards it. I know, a total dare and a move. But this time, something in me was telling me to go back to the car immediately. How about we drive down the road a couple times, slowly point the flashlight out the window and see if we can see anything? I suggested to my wife. Yes, let's do it. I was shining my flashlight out of my rolled down window, shining it in the direction of the domes. Nothing. I see literally nothing. We turned around, I hand the flashlight to my wife, so now we can continue to watch the domes out of her window. We reached the start of the domes, and I slowed down to about five miles per hour. My wife is peering into the darkness, when out of nowhere she screams, Drive, 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 drive! I dropped it into first, and we booked it out of there. Right before my wife had started to freak out, I had heard the most clear, plain-as-day growl in my right ear. Mm. Naturally, I thought that that's what she had heard, and that had sent her screaming. Boy, was I wrong. She freaked out because she said the silhouette of a young girl had suddenly appeared and she had a wide, gaping black mouth with razor teeth. Ugh. It smiled at her and said, hi there, oh in a playful, childlike tone. We haven't been back there since. Keep up the creepiness and spookiness. Love the podcast, Josh. I like the, uh, thanks, Josh. I like just the hi there. Hi there. <laughs> that's, all, that's, that's almost- My eyes are bleeding. <laughs> It's almost creepier because, than sc like it's screaming. I know, something. I know. Like the calm. Okay, I couldn't stop thinking about that. Like you can't, you've never said like, God, I've been staring at this computer for so long, my eyes feel like they're bleeding. Like you've never said anything like that? Mm -mm. Nope. 
My eyes feel like they're bleeding. Uh uh-uh. uh. I've never heard. Like, because your eyes get like so tired and you're just like, ugh. Never? I get it. But no, uh, now, okay. okay. I'm going to, con- you, you, as you know what, if you want. No, no, we can't because you're going to be distracted. It's no, distracting I'm gonna, to I'm the gonna, listeners. I'm going to consult. Uh, Who are you going to consult? The internet. <laughs> my eyes are bleeding. <laughs> I'm so tired. My eyes are bleeding. See if that's a real thing that shows up as a phrase. I just feel like that's like. There's okay. Even when you put in so tired, my eyes are. <laughs> it doesn't fill. Google says closing. No. Blurry. No. Watering. No. But it. No, but it's like you have. It's and like a dramatic. Do, and then I do BL. Still, Google's like, nah, nah, no. BL, no. Bleed. No, no. Try, try. My eyes feel like they're bleeding. <laughs> 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 when you put in so tired, my eyes are bleeding. The immediate thing that comes up is a bunch of medical advice, related health conditions, fatigue, so, diabetes, uh, dry eyes. Fatigue, fatigue. No, but this is like medical. This isn't. I like, know, but it's like something that could happen. So it's like you know. No, but you were you weren't saying <laughs> you weren't saying it's something that could happen. You're saying it's like well, you know that common phrase <laughs> that people say like my eyes are so tired they feel like they're bleeding. I feel like I've been staring at this computer for so long, my eyes feel like they could bleed. I'm just, you know what? I'm just going to put in that. I'm just going to put it and see if the internet comes back with anyone else doing that. I'm a unique soul. <laughs> Sorry. What are you started, doing? It started. I'm doing. I'm doing the the, the voice to text saying, "I'm so tired. My eyes feel like they're bleeding." <laughs> nope. The internet's like, "What the fuck are you talking about?" That, that's not what Google said. More, Google didn't say what the fuck you're talking about. Google said. <laughs> Just again, related health conditions. Google's just concerned about you. I understand that, but like that doesn't mean that no one says that. Well, yeah, people have said it. One person. <laughs> it's a common thing that one person has been saying for a while. <laughs> it's a common. It's a common saying of yours. I'm gonna get a tattoo of eyes bleeding on my body just because this is so great. You're gonna try and force this out there to like to have other people start oh, saying no. it. Sometimes I say weird things. <laughs> I'm just gonna throw in like like I'm just trying to think of like common sayings that involve blood. You know, it's like I can't even think like, oh man, that's this food's messing me up. <laughs> my stomach's so upset, my butthole's bleeding. Let me tell you, if you were a girl, you'd have some common sayings about blood. <laughs> okay. But yeah, period, but yeah, okay. Sure. Oh yeah, there's a lot of things we say that no one wants to hear. <laughs> Only other women are like, uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. Well, Sorry, it's hard to turn those pages. My arms <laughs> eyes are, are bleeding. My arms are so tired. It feels like they're bleeding. <laughs> as people say. <laughs> uh, do you want, want me to start with the Annabelles? God, there's so many Annabelles. I have to I just feel like my lips are about to start bleeding. Um, but I'll, I'll try and get through this. <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, the following Annabelles for uh, supporting the show. Uh, Jessica Emke. Michael Peterson. <laughs> Michael Peterson? Is that the guy from The Staircase? Oh, yeah, totally. He listens to our show. <laughs> uh, Pirate. Oh my God. Ocean Van Howe. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Joseph Vera. Sarah Eubanks. Uh, Kirsten Tricano. Ann Possel. Joey Roscoe. T-Dog Woof Woof. <laughs> Amber Sellen. I bet his eyes bleed. <laughs> <laughs> Princess Peachy Bottom. I love that one. That is a, that is a great one. Yeah. And Andy Bloody Eyes. <laughs> Old Andy Bloody Eyes. <laughs> oh my God. I can't stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> you got the giggles now. <sighs> okay. I'd like to thank the following Annabelle's Jonathan Take Talk, uh, Samantha Meek, Chelsea Flores. Okay. Now, Melissa, but she has the little like thing over the E. And I, based on her last name being Shamarod, I'm going to guess she's French. Mm, okay. mm-hmm. Uh Ethan Whited, Dwayna. That's, that is just so you know, her parents did this to her, is the female version of Dwayne. Oh, Dwayna. Yeah. Never okay. met a Dwayna. I think, I think she said it was like her dad's name or something. Okay. Uh, Nathan Case, Rachel Hampton, the Shadow Wombat, Scott Kessel, Cameo Lawson, and Brianna Thomas. Well, thank all of you for supporting the show. We appreciate it so much. And did now you, you just some, cut me off? No, now you have some spooby shout outs. Okay. Phew. I was setting you up for your spooby shout outs. I thought you were going into your closing remarks. No. Nope. Okay. To Baby Cheeks from Chicken Nugget, a.k.a. <laughs> Muddy River Water Eyes. <laughs> this is it. Is that really? They wrote- muddy River Water Eyes. We need to talk. Because oh, if you man. have Muddy River Eyes and I have bloody eyes. I'm so tired. It feels like my eyes are muddy rivers. There you go. Happiest of all birthdays to you. Uh Oh, no. I feel like I wrote this down. Wrong. To Tina from Alexis. I have Tyne, but I think I meant to type Tina. I was very going very fast this morning. <laughs> You're the absolute best. To Tiffany from Dan. Happy birthday. 
to Kim from Jen Jen. Happy birthday, happy anniversary, and thank you, thank you for never giving up hope as I struggled with addiction. You're the bestest friend ever. I love you. And to, to Zippy from Dossie, happy birthday. Hang in there, but also suck it up. I love you. Uh, and are, yeah, yeah, sending a lot of love to them. Their dad recently passed away uh, in an unexpected accident. Uh, and to Boobers from Beavers. Happy birthday, beautiful. Boobers and Beavers. Boobers and Beavers. <laughs> I want to know the story behind that. Mm -hmm. And that is our show. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of true terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else. Info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thank you to Logan Keith, Tyler C. for the work on social media, and to Logan again for running badmagicmerch.com, and to Ryan Handelsman for managing social media. Thanks to Logan for producing and directing today, Zach Cohen for custom sound beds, uh, Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails, and to our book editor, Drew Atana, for polishing and preparing listener stories for book number four. Thanks to producer Sophie Evans for finding the first story I told this week, and to Olivia Lee for finding the second. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to watch this show. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want pictures that accompany the episodes and more at Scared to Death Podcast. And there's Creeps and Peepers, the Facebook group with over 20,000 horror-loving members. So many people. You can uh, follow us on TikTok as well if you want little highlights from the show at Scared to Death Podcast. And if you don't want to hear ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, check out our Patreon to get the entire catalog ad-free and more. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope your eyes bleed out of your head. <laughs> I was waiting for it. And that you're scared to death. Bye, bloody eyes. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. My arms are so tired. It feels like they're bleeding. <laughs> <laughs>